All right, good morning, GYC. Good morning, faithful few. Those who have made sacrifice to get up early in the morning. Uh, I couldn't raise my hand at any of these questions from Sephora just a second ago. I didn't have five hours of sleep, but that's okay. God give us, gives us strength, and he's going to be with us this morning as we look into his word. Have you been blessed so far? Amen. I think... This has been one of the most amazing couple of days in, the, in my life. It was extraordinary to be here. Um, I'm part of the logistics team of GYC also. So we had a lot of work to do, but it was, it was really blessed. And I, I'm very grateful to be part of this uh, movement. And I'm thankful that you all came to this GYC Europe. This morning, I want to talk with you about a topic um, well, our theme of GYC has been the Son of Man should be glorified. Uh, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And throughout the morning devotions, if you've been here, we have uh, looked at different areas of, of, of what, in our life where the Son of Man, where Jesus can be glorified in our life. And today I want to specifically do a little bit of recap to find out what it means that the Son of Man should be glorified in our life and also put an emphasis on how we can glorify Jesus Christ in our school, in our university, and wherever we work, wherever we are. Before we start, let's have a short word of prayer again. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us all together. Thank you that we can be here today on this last day of GYC Europe. You've been blessing us, you've been giving us so many blessings these last days, and we are thankful that we can be here, that we can experience this, and humbly we ask you now that you might send your Holy Spirit, that you might guide my words, that you might empty me of myself and fill me with your Holy Spirit, that only your words will proceed out of my mouth, and that, that everybody here would understand what you're trying to say. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us, and we pray everything in your wonderful name. Amen. The hour has come. This was the theme of this GYC Europe, and... Today I want to, as I said, to look specifically on one, on one topic, how we can glorify Jesus in our life, in our workplace, in our university, in our, in our school. We, are, we have here young people from every generation and from, from every country, so many countries, I mean 45 countries, wow, I was so amazed when I saw the statistics as the registrations were coming in, when I saw people from South Korea, even from China coming here, although it's just a GYC Europe. But God has definitely been blessing this, and so many people were coming. I'm very grateful. And we all, at some point in our life, are facing this moment where we will, where we will go into a, a job or maybe into schooling, into university. We're deciding for what we're going to do. And not all of us have the privilege to study or to work in a surrounding with Adventists or with Christians. I'm sure some of you come from very secular countries where you have been maybe experienced that... It's really hard to live as a Christian, to really stand as a Christian. So this morning, I want to begin with a little recap also what it means to glorify God. The word glory, there are two, two meanings to this word. For one, to glorify means to shine. It means to demonstrate and to manifest and the divine. In other words, to the God's glory, it rep represents his presence. God's glory is, is always present when he is at a certain place. In, um, on Mount Sinai, we can see God's glory that was covered with the clouds. Or later in Exodus 40, we can read about the glory of God that, was filled, that filled the tabernacle. Or think of Solomon's temple when he was uh, praying in Second Chronicles 7. The glory of God filled the temple that he built. So the glory of God is his presence and the radiation of him being present. The second aspect... Uh, what glory means is also to reflect, to glorify. It means to reflect, to show forth, and to demonstrate and to express the image of an object or a person that it may be seen by all. The Greek word, and I have to bring in a little, bleak, a little bit of Greek since I'm a theology student, is doxa. Can you say doxa? Doxa, all right. It means to glorify. And this word doxa, it can also mean to signify or to ascribe honor to somebody. Let's open up with me um, John chapter 17 to Jesus' amazing prayer. And we want to pick it up in verse 1. John chapter, chapter 17. I'm going to start in verse 1. John 
John chapter 17. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Verse 6, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. So Jesus says here in verse, now, in verse 4, I glorified you on earth. What does that mean? What does it mean that Jesus glorified God on earth? Well, he explains in verse 2. It says, I have manifested your name in, in verse 6. And in verse 2 it says that he has authority, authority to give eternal life. He has the authority, he has the ability to give eternal life. What is eternal life? When we, when we hear about eternal life, we always think of, well, it's an, it's an endless period of time. It's, it's never going to end. It's gonna, always going to be. We're never going to die. This is what we think about eternal life. But actually, Jesus is highlighting in verse 3 um, an aspect of eternal life. He's highlighting the, the quality of eternal life. Let's look in verse 3. It says, and this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So eternal li life, according to verse 3, is to know God. How did Jesus do that? How did, how did Jesus glorify God when, while he was here on earth? In verse 6 it says, I have manifested your, your name to the people. <laughs> What's God's name? I mean, we have a lot of different names in the Bible. We have Yahweh, we have uh, Jehovah, we have... Uh, Elohim in the Hebrew, we have a lot of different names for God. But it's interesting, in the Bible, when we talk about God's name, it often means his character. God's name is, often, is often meaning his character and, and what he is like. So when Jesus is saying here, I've manifested your name to the people, he's actually saying, I've manifested God's character to the people. I've shown the people this is how God is. He's saying, people, look, if you want to know how God is, look at me. Look at, look at what I'm doing. This character of God. He's revealing this character of God to men. And this was necessary because the image of God, the image the people had from God, it was destroyed. It had, they had a wrong image. It was deformed by Satan. Actually, Satan started out with lying to the people about who God is. He, he called God a liar. But we all know that Satan is the father of lies, Right? So, since the beginning, until the end, Satan will always try to lie about God's character. So it was necessary for Jesus to come to this earth and to manifest God's character to the people, to make them understand how God is. So, when, what did Jesus mean when he said that the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified? I mean, the theme of this GYC Europe has come from John chapter 12, and actually I want to find out what it means in this context. So let's turn some pages back to John chapter 12, all right? John chapter 12, and let's start in verse 20. John chapter 12, verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks... So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What situation preceded this statement where we have our theme from GYC Europe from? It was the scene that they were at the feast in Jerusalem, and these Greeks came up, and they said, what did they say? We want to see Jesus. Okay? It wasn't the Jews, it was some Greeks. They wanted to see Jesus. And uh, I love how Ellen White describes the scene in The Desire of Ages. I think they're going to put up the quote on the screen so you can read with me. When Christ heard the eager request we would see Jesus echoing the hungering cry of the world, his countenance lighted up and he said, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. 
In the request of the Greeks, he saw an earnest of the results of his great sacrifice. You know, this was a really bittersweet moment for Jesus. Jesus, you have to, you have to try to imagine this. It was his last few days before he would be crucified, before he would be put to a shameful death. And death was approaching him. He knew what would happen. He knew, although he was majestically welcomed in Jerusalem, he would be bitterly rejected a few days later by the same people. And in this moment, in this, in this moment, suddenly he gets this glimpse of light and these Greek men come up and Sister Wright uh, goes on and explains, in these strangers he saw the pledge of a great harvest. When the partition wall between Jew and Gentile should be broken down and all nations, tongues and peoples should hear the message of salvation, the anticipation of this, the consummation of his hopes is expressed in the words, the hour is come, the Son of Man should be glorified. So although the dark clouds of death were approaching Jesus, they were surrounding Jesus, his face lit up in this second when these Greek men said, we want to see Jesus. And he looked into the future and he looked to this day when he saw that the gospel, the message that his sacrifice was given for, our, for, our, to, for us to be saved, that this message would go all around the world. So he looked into the future and, and at this moment he knew what he was about to do would not be for nothing. That all people who would believe in the truth about God's character, that they would be saved. So what does it mean that the Son of Man should be glorified in, this, in the context of the story here in John chapter 12? It means, as I just said, that the gospel would go around the world and God's character, the truth about God's character, would be revealed to all men. Now in these past days we heard a lot about how God can be glorified in our life and in, 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 in my school and in my, in my church and in, in my mission, in my life. But today I want to kind of summarize a little bit what it means that God should be glorified in our life. And in fact, I want to share with you four steps. Four steps, and you can be sure to write them down if you're not too tired. Four steps where we can see how we today can glorify God in our life. All right? Are you with me? Yes, amen. I like Benjamin, he's always enthusiastic about this. All right, step number one. Know your God and know your faith. Step number one, know your God and know your faith. And for this, let's look at a young, brave girl. Flip your Bibles open to 2 Kings chapter 5. And we're going to start in verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 5. And starting in verse 1. Second Kings chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria? He would cure him of his leprosy. I think you all know the story of this little young girl who lived in a captive, was a captive in, in, in Syria. And I don't want to go into too much details, but note one thing. This little girl, she was a slave. She was a captive in a foreign land, far away from anything she knew, far away from her friends, from her family, probably in her early teens, and with probably no friends of, of the same faith as she has. Under the bondage of a Syrian commander, all alone, she was brave enough to stand up and go to this commander and tell him what to do. To, she gave him the advice what to do uh, in order to be healed and to be better. Why would she do that? Why would she, wh where did she gain such a confidence to do that? After all, she was just a slave, right? She didn't have any rights. She was not, probably not even allowed to speak. But still she, she went up to the, to the wife of Naaman and said, send him to Elisha. He can heal her. What kind of character must somebody have to do such a thing? To, to actually go to the enemy and tell him what to do in order to be better, to, to be healthy, to live. I think only somebody with a character changed by God 
would do that. Only somebody who is confident and convinced of what he's believing, of his faith, and only somebody who really knows God would have the boldness to go up to an enemy commander and tell him what to do in order to be healed. So this girl, she knew God. She knew what she believed in. She knew her faith. And let's not forget, in all of this, she was all alone. She didn't even have three friends like Daniel. Daniel had three people with him in, in Babylon, and they could kind of, you know, uh, talk to each other and, and share their problems. But this girl was all alone. And all she had was what God had revealed to her in her heart and her faith and what she knew about God. So maybe you feel alone. Maybe where you are, I don't know where you're from. Some of you have met, but maybe some of you are all alone in a university or in your workplace. You're the only Christian or the only Adventist at where you are. Maybe you feel alone and maybe you're even scared to, to share Christ to other people. I want to tell you, take courage. Be like the little Hebrew girl. Know your God and know your faith. We just read in John chapter 17 verse 3 that eternal life is to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. If you know your faith, if you know your God, you will not be afraid to stand and when there's nobody standing with you. So... Let's not be discouraged. Let's know our God and let's know our faith. And even if you're not alone, if you, even if you're, maybe even you have like Adventist friends in your university course or in your job, maybe you're working with Adventists, you never know. Maybe God will one day put you into a situation, into your personal Syria, where you will have to witness to other people all alone. Can you say with confidence that you will be ready then, that you really know your faith, that, that you will be able to stand Know your God and know your faith. In the place of your education and also everywhere else, Satan is trying to mold our characters. He's, he's trying to, who, to get this wrong image of God into our brains and to mold our mindsets. And he's trying that through our professors, through the teachers, through education. So don't accept everything you hear. Be, cr be critical. I'm not saying we have to criticize everything, but be critical and really ask Try to find out the truth about what people say. So test what they say, but also don't be afraid to challenge some statements. Maybe this atheist professor of yours or this, 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 this teacher who is making fun of Christians, maybe he will at one point be your chance to witness to your classroom. But we can only witness if we know God and if we know our faith. Let's read what Sister White says. In, in Testimonies, uh, Volume 4. One earnest, conscientious, faithful young man in a school is an inestimable treasure. We can be a treasure to the people around us where we are. But we have to know our God and we have to know our faith. So step number one, know your God, know your faith. Step number two, abide in Christ. Abide. What does abide mean? It means to stay, it means to live with, it means to dwell to dwell in a certain place. Let's turn back to John chapter 15 for that. John chapter 15, some famous Bible verses, starting in verse 4. John chapter 15, we're going to start in verse 4. John chapter 15, starting in verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, note verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Jesus is clear here. He wants to spend time with us. He wants to be with us. He wants to have this relationship with us. We hear this all the time, but it's true. God wants to dwell with us. And in verse in verse 8, it says, By this my Father is glorified. We're talking about God's glorification all the time. 
How can we glorify God? Well, it says, but this my Father is glorified, that, they, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. If he does not abide in us, if God does not abide in us, whatever we do, whatever fruit we bring forth, it will be worth nothing. It will not have eternal value. If we think about Exodus, remember? Exodus chapter 25. It says, God is telling Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. It started out back then. I mean, even earlier also. But God wanted to live with the Israelites. Or if we go on the other end of the Bible, in Revelation 21, you can read that where, he, where, they talk, where John is seeing in a vision, he's saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. So the Bible is telling us that God wants to live with us. He wants to, he wants to be with us. He wants to have companionship with us. He wants to have a relationship with us. And I don't know about you, but I, I think that's fantastic. From the beginning to the end of the Bible, it's full of these... Of these um, well, these hopeful statements of God. He said, come on, I want to be with you, please. But God is not forcing himself upon us. And as Indira said in her morning devotion yesterday, she told us that, that God also respects our decision. and He will, in fact, wait outside of our encampment. He will wait out there for us until we are ready. But he's sending his love messages and waiting for us to respond. To abide in Christ means to accept this companionship. It doesn't mean that God is coming just for a visit here and there. You know, it doesn't mean that, that he's coming for five minutes and then maybe in the morning five minutes there and then, okay, next week again. And, uh, oh no, you know, once a week on Sabbath, then that's when, I, when I'm like this with God. To live with God, to have a relationship with God means to live with him every day, every hour, in fact, every minute and every second. Amen? I know it's a struggle sometimes. But if we truly want to glorify God, we need to have this close connection with him all the time. All the time. This is, means to abide in Christ. Spending time with God, preferably in the morning, and really putting everything in front of his throne. So, because then, even though we are surrounded maybe by, by Syria, we will be able to to stand because we know what we believe in. We know who God is because he's our friend, because he's with us every day. Listen to this quote from our prophetess. Those students who profess to love God and obey the truth should possess that degree of self-control and strength of religious principle that will enable them to remain unmoved amid temptations and to stand up for Jesus in the college, at their boarding house, or wherever they may be. Religion is not to be worn merely as a cloak in the house of God. Religious principles should be characterized the entire life. This strength that the spirit of prophecy is talking about here, this is something we can only obtain by abiding in Christ daily. The strength of principle, we need to spend time with God every day, every day. So step number two, abide in Christ. Step number one was know your God, know your faith. Step number two, abide in Christ. Step number three, be true through you. Brother Ashrick was with us in, uh, in Bogenhofen in our seminary last year. And uh, he had a class with, with us theology students. And one of uh, my colleagues, he, he asked him, David, what is your, what do you think is the best method of, of preaching, the best style of preaching? And uh, his answer was brilliant and to the point. He said, be true through you. Now, he was addressing future pastors, but I'm, I think he's going to be okay if I stretch this appeal to all of us, since we're all called to be priests of God's kingdom, right? He said, what does it mean to, to be true through ourself? You have to know God created us unique. We're all unique in a sense. We're all not, ex not the same copy of somebody else. Sometimes we try to copy people, but we are all unique. And God wants to use our uniqueness to reach a certain group of people. You know, we're all special. And, and if God, if we, if, we, if we try to be somebody else, if we are trying to hide the truth about ourselves, we are actually robbing God of an opportunity. Because it may be that through our uniqueness, God can reach a certain group of people. A certain, uh, you know, some, somebody, somebody else would not reach. 
you can, a, a pastor will never reach the entire audience. Some, some people will always be doing something else. But some people will. God can use this pastor to reach a certain amount of people. And so God wants to use your uniqueness. And if you, if you are hiding yourself, if you are trying to, to be somebody else that you are not really, then you're actually robbing God of an opportunity. So be true through yourself. But also let God change you. We're all supposed to, to get into this close relationship that we might be changed to Christ-likeness because we abide in Him daily. If we abide in Him daily, He can form us. He can work with us every day. And if we, if we, if we cease to, to, to be with Him, if we cease to spend time with Him, it will be harder for Him. It will take longer. So let us take courage and, and stand and work with Him daily. And we glorify God with our lives. And then when we witness to other people, we should do it by giving our personal testimony. This is crucial because our personal testimony is one of the most effective ways. The spirit of prophecy is uh, very clear about this. As he says, to every, man in the, in, to, no, to every man the Lord has given his work. And if the members of the church have indeed opened their hearts to the son of righteousness, wherever they are found, they will be a light for in them Christ will be glorified. In them. Okay? So through us, Christ can be glorified. We have to open our heart to Jesus. And we have to be true through us. We can only witness if we, are, if we let him work in us and if we don't try to be somebody else. We can glorify God by telling people, other people our personal testimony. What a God has done with us. This is one of the strongest possibilities to reach people so let us repeat step number one was know your God know your faith step number two abiding Christ step number three be true through you all right last but not least step number four get active okay Jonathan to be active does that mean I need to get out of my comfortable couch that does, does that mean that I have to spend time on doing something doesn't mean I have to to work and uh, doesn't mean I have to you know uh, yeah to turn off the TV or you know not do thing the things I like yes that's what it means to be active means to to do something to start something to work but the thing is if you go through the steps I just told you you will love it you will love to work for God and to be active for God is actually one of the greatest things you can experience. But some of you might say, okay, but what should I do? I'm alone. I'm all alone in the place where I am. I'm, I have nobody who is helping me. I'm the only Christian in my family. I'm the only Adventist in my school. But God calls us still to be missionaries wherever we go. So it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be a GYC Europe. It can be a small thing. But every small thing, if it is being done earnestly, with a, with a with the heart guided by God, the smallest thing can have the smallest effort. It can have an eternal value. What can we do? What are some practical tips that we can do? Start or join a Bible group. It doesn't even have to be an Adventist Bible group. I've I've experienced this once in in Austria. I was at an, in in a city called Graz, and there there was a, they had like a Bible study group there from different denominations, people, young, young students, they were just coming together to, to share their faith and talk about God. You can join one of those groups. I'm sure there are some of you who attend university where, where these groups exist. And there you can share your faith. Or just do small things like you, you used maybe those glow pamphlets during the outreach here on Sabbath. Take them with you, with you wherever you go. Just leave them behind you in the bus. Or you can also start a prayer group in your church. It doesn't have to be big. Our earnest efforts, if they, are, if they are really earnest and they are guided by God, they will have eternal value. Are you scared? After step number one, you will lose your fear because you know your God, because you know your faith. Okay, Jonathan, I understand. We have to do all of this. We know this. We have heard this many times. But where to start? Where, how, how can I like... How can I begin with this? There's only one way to begin, and you all know this. Whatever mission effort, whatever we do, it always has to start on our knees. Prayer is the most important thing when we want to go out. 
never, ever start mission work or any effort without prayer because we need to be guided by God in, in, every, in every second, in every minute, whenever, whatever we do. So whatever you do, start with prayer. And don't only, um, don't only do it for, you know, for, okay, we're Adventists, we have to pray for it before, we ever, before everything we do. Just tell God everything about it, all the obstacles you have, everything that is maybe stopping you from being active in the church. Maybe you have church leaders who are, who are trying to stop your mission efforts. Maybe you have church leaders who don't care if there's a youth group. Prayer can change hearts. Interceding for others. Prayer is one of the most important things when we want to do mission work. God wants himself to be glorified to all of us. God wants his character to be revealed in the classroom or in that job and wherever you are, in that office where you work. He's willing to, that's amazing, he's willing to use us little creatures to glorify him. And it is amazing what happens when we pray for, for mission opportunities. God prepares people to, that we can meet. I don't know if you've experienced this, but I have done that. It was really I was always very skeptical about it, but one time, in fact, it was at one of our meetings for GYC Europe in preparation. I was praying, God, I have this train ride tomorrow, and I want to, I want to somehow share my faith with somebody. And so on the trip, this was actually the day when Jessie had her, her, had her accident. On the trip, um, 10 minutes before we arrived in Linz, I saw this one woman sat, sat in front of me, and, and she was reading a book about some... Some, uh, it was some super find your supernatural power or something. So I was like, uh huh. So I looked at it, <laughs> and um, I fast uh, took my iPhone out and Googled the author, and I found out that he's like a psychologist and, and also interested in supernatural things. Anyways, so I started a conversation with her and just was asking her if it's interesting what she's reading, and she immediately opened up and she talked about how her son had died two years ago, and she's looking for something, and she's looking for. For, for, for something more than she can see here. And immediately I knew in my, in my head, God had answered my prayer. He prepared a person and he led me to the person. We can all experience this every day. It doesn't have to be only at the outreach at GYC or only at the out, outreach with the youth group. It can be every day. Just have a book with you. Have a mission book with you. And ask for mission opportunities. But let us also not forget the mission we have in our church. There are so many brothers and sisters that have gone the wrong direction or they have maybe they have been blinded by something let us not forget the mission work we have in our church yes outreach is important but also the outreach within the church is important so when we go home let us also pray for our brothers and sisters so that they may be revived let's bring revival to our churches if we totally surrender to god if he will give us opportunities to reach out to people and especially where you are in, in the school place and your workplace but one thing is also important. Let us not forget that people are watching us. I mean, you are in the, maybe in the school for two, three, four, five, ten years. What do the people know about you when, when you're done? Okay, they might know you're a Seventh-day Adventist. Um, you don't work on Sabbath. You don't go to school on Sabbath. You don't eat pork and you don't drink alcohol. But do these people really, are they, are they drawn to you because you are reflecting Jesus Christ? Is that happening? Can they see a difference in the life you live? If not, if not you might have to ask yourself, are you, are you truly okay with God? We have to reflect Jesus Christ. We have to reflect God's character to this world. And God will change us and God will give us opportunities, but we have to be open for it. Let's read one more quote. and It's actually a repetition of the quote we had before. Those students who profess to love God and obey the truth should possess that degree of self-control and strength of a religious principle that will enable them to stand up for Jesus in the college or wherever they may be. Wherever they may be. Religion is not to be worn merely as a cloak in the house of God. Religious principles should, be char should characterize the entire life. Wherever we may be. Another quote. The Lord calls upon our youth, and that is us to labor as canvases and evangelists, to do house-to-house -house work in the place that have not yet heard the truth. He speaks to our young men, saying, Ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You, don't, you say you don't know how to do it? 
you don't know how to share Christ effectively, well, GYC is an opportunity to, to know how to do it. But when I say get active, I also say get trained. Read your Bible, pray, have this morning devotion every day. I mean, you all know these things, right? And I, I can only suggest to you to go even further and maybe attend a mission college or, or a mission school where you will be even better trained to become a, a, a successful worker for God. Get trained, get active. That was step number four. So when we go through all these four steps that we just talked about, I can guarantee you that through this process, you will get to know God so much more better and you will, you will have a relationship that is so strong that no Syria, no Naaman, no atheist professor will ever shake you. But we have to be humble and we have to stay close to God. We are all sinful human beings, but God is still willing to give us this opportunity to glorify him. And in fact, we can glorify God in a way that not even the angels can. We need God present in our daily life. And when he dwells in us, we will reflect his character through the Holy Spirit. Let's do what Jesus had in mind when he said, the hour has come that the Son of Man shall be glorified, meaning to preach the gospel to the world. It will lead others to Christ, and at the same time, you will gain a closer relationship with Jesus. God is with you, and you can be a powerful witness for him and glorify the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, in your school, in your workplace, but in your life, in your family, everywhere where you go. So today I want to appeal to you before we go back home, before we return from this hype that we have here, this motivation congress, when we go home, let us truly ask God to help us to glorify Him, to help us to be humble that the Holy Spirit really can fill us and that we can really share Him and Him only. We need to glorify God. When, when God's character has been revealed to every man, He can come back. So let's get started. So I want to appeal to you today. If you want to glorify God in your life, if you want to, be, if you want to know your faith, if you want to abide in Christ, if you want to um, get active, if you want to be true through in your witnessing, if you want it, then say yes to God today and ask him for that. And um, I want to close with prayer. I want us all to, to have small little prayer groups and I'm going to finish it. And uh, we want to stand up for that right now. We want to ask God to really fill us with the Holy Spirit, to make us humble so that we might glorify him when we return to our home countries today. Let's have about one or two minutes together and I will close in prayer.
Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, some amazing days have been passed by and then we have, we could experience this wonderful GYC Europe and we'd heard so many different things and we could meet so many different people and in all of this, we were seeking to know how to glorify you. And we have come to realize that it's basically always the same principle to have a close relationship with you and to abide in you daily and just to live with you, to love you and through our life, you're willing to reflect your character and to reveal the character in order for you to be glorified on this world. And so today we ask you to please make us humble. Please clean our hearts from everything that, that is distracting us, from everything that is between us. And let us be true companions, faithful servants for you. And we ask you to give us strength because we are in our sinful, in our sinful, sinful human beings and we always struggle with really sticking to our decisions. So I ask now for everybody who made a decision on this GYC Europe or today that you might strengthen him, that you might be with him and that you might guard his angels around him in order for him to really stay close to you. And God, when you lead us into a place, into our personal Syria, please prepare us before you send us there. Because we want to be witnesses. We want to glorify you. And we thank you that you are patient with us. We thank you that you, yes, that you love us so much that you are willing to work together with us. We are so dependent on you and today we want to again recommit our life to you. We want to give you all of us. We want to give everything to you. Because the hour has come that you might be glorified in our life, in our family and in, to everybody who we meet. That you might be glorified. As we ask everything in your wonderful name. Bring us home, Jesus. Amen.